Oddly enough, this was the only public execution in the USSR in the entire 20th century. Moreover, the Nazis, convicted of crimes against the civilian population, were to be executed in Pskov, where the atrocities were committed. However, the Soviet government decided that this execution should take place in Leningrad, so that residents who survived the terrible blockade could see how a retribution would overtake the criminals. The legal foundation for the execution were laid back on April 19, 1943, when the decree of the Presidium of the Supreme Soviet of the USSR appeared with a long title, on the penalties for the Nazi civilians guilty of killing and torturing the Soviet civilian population and captured Red Army soldiers, for spies, traitors from number of Soviet citizens and for their accomplices. This document established that all those guilty of mass execution of the civilian population, prisoners of war, in addition enemy spies and saboteurs, traitors to the motherland, should be executed by Henning. It was also established that such execution should be carried out in public. The latter was intended to show all criminals and traitors that retribution for committed crimes cannot be avoided. Moreover, the decree even declared that the bodies of the executed should hang for several days as a symbol of inevitable retribution. It should be noted here that despite the seeming cruelty of the decree, the Soviet government was well aware that it was impossible to judge the frontline soldiers who carried out orders. Therefore, public execution, as we mentioned, concerned only those who stained themselves precisely with crimes and punitive actions that could not be attributed to the actions of military personnel on the fronts. So, despite periodic publication about alleged atrocities by the Smirsch counterintelligence, this name is an acronym, from death to spice. The investigators of this organization very carefully approach the inquiry of crimes, while in order for the accused to be hanged publicly, indisputable evidence was collected and voiced at trial. Moreover, the courts were held only openly, often in the presence of foreign correspondents, so it was impossible for this organization to lose face. During the Leningrad process, for example, there were a total of at least 2,000 spectators who entered the hall with passes. By the way, out of the entire cohort of defendants in this trial, three were practically acquitted, having replaced the death sentences with camp terms, which could demonstrate the objectivity of the court, although perhaps ostentatious. In total, there were only 11 people in the dock. Major General Remelinger, Captain Straffing Karl, Oberfeldwebel Engel Fritz, Oberfeldwebel Berm Ernst, Lieutenant Sonnenfeld Eduard, Soldiers Janiki Gerhardt and Ger Erwin Ernst, and Oberfreider Skatka Erwin. There were also three more defendants about whom we will discuss below. The trial began in December 1945 and took place in the Viborg House of Culture located near the Finland station. Most importantly, the process took place completely publicly, with daily media coverage. The accusation was based on data provided by the Extraordinary State Commission which reported that during the occupation in the territory of the Leningrad region, about 50,000 civilians were killed, and about 400,000 were driven away for forced labor in Germany. At the same time, it was stated at the trial that the total number of victims might be higher, but the Nazis tried by any means to hide their crimes, so it could be assumed that the data presented by commission were underestimated. The first and main accused was, of course, Heinrich Remelinger who until the liberation of Pskov was in the position of the military commandant of the city. Despite the fact that the general tried in every possible way to avoid punishment, arguing that he was only following the orders, he was charged with carrying out 14 punitive actions against civilians, as a result of which at least 145 villages were destroyed and burned. At least 8,000 people were executed and burned and at least another 25,000 people were deported to Germany. Direct orders for executions of civilians arrested and held in prisons were given by the company commanders of the so-called Special Battalions, Captain Karl Straffing, Oberlieutenant Wies, and the commander of the so-called Special Group, Lieutenant Sonnenfeld. As for Captain Straffing, the facts about him were no less monstrous, so he personally ordered the execution of children aged 10 to 13, 
which happened near the village of Ostrov. In total, on the orders of the officer, 25 children were shot. During their retreat, which was again documented, just for the sake of fun and amusement, he shot all civilians who came across on the way. In total, the executioner killed at least 200 people. Lieutenant Sonnenfeld left not far from his captain, who also personally executed at least 200 people and supervised the work of his subordinates during the complete destruction of the villages of Strasheva, Zapolye, Seklitsa, Masli, Nikolaevo, and others. It is interesting that among the defendants there were also ordinary soldiers. However, after the accuser began to read out the testimony, all the questions from those present why ordinary soldiers were tried disappeared. So Gerhard Genike personally overtook even his commanders in terms of the number of executed people. He accounted for at least 300 civilians. <laughs> At the trial, the prosecution called these officers almost the general's pupils, presenting quite interesting facts. For example, it was said that many went to serve in a special battalion solely for the sake of getting a bigger salary. By the way, one of the defendants, Vies, did not admit his guilt, and no unequivocal evidence of his guilt was presented at the trial, which had a serious impact on the verdict. The executors of the orders, the surgeons and privates named above, and together with them Vogel and Dürr, according to the investigation, personally shot at least 11 people each. At the same time, as in the case with Vies, the investigation was unable to find indisputable evidence of the direct participation in the execution of both Vogel and Dürr. Therefore, already during the trial itself, it became clear that three of the eleven accused could avoid the noose. Actually, that's how it happened. It is interesting that many fighters of those same special battalions agreed to cooperate during the investigation. So, at the trial, they were not in the status of accused, but in the status of witnesses. Moreover, the traitor Sertyuk, who spoke about the concentration camp in Kretsky, was also a witness. By the way, this is one of the few cases when collaboration is, was discussed in open court. After the war, in the USSR, as a rule, all trials of traitors to the motherland took place behind closed doors. As in Minsk trial, during the trial in Leningrad, documentary footage was also shown, filmed by the war correspondents while they were at the disposal of partisan and sabotage detachments. What was shown at the trial was reported even by the TASS agency. The film reproduces dozens of orders from the German command issued in the occupied areas. Each invariably ends with the words, to be shot. Under one of these orders is a sweeping signature, Remelinger. In addition, during the process, Facts were cited not only of the direct guilt of the accused, but also of those atrocities that were committed by the occupation authorities of the territory of the Leningrad region. The attempts of the defendants, as mentioned earlier, to exonerate themselves with the statement, I was just following an order, were commented by Soviet prosecutors quite caustically. The executioner, in white gloves, Remelinger continues the game already familiar to the Soviet investigation. It was as if he only received orders from above and sent them down, without even writing down the outgoing ones. At the top sat Hitler and Sacco. The court, on the basis of the evidence provided, as well as a questioning of witnesses, by the way, 118 people were invited whose testimony was clear and ambiguous, sentenced eight Nazis to death by hanging, the remaining three to various terms of hard labor. It is interesting that the verdict was approved in Moscow, where the court decision was sent. Given the degree of guilt of each of the defendants, we consider it necessary to sentence the defendants Remelinger, Strafling, Sonnenfeld, Beam, Engel, Janicki, Skatka, Cherer to death by hanging, defendants Vogel, Dorr and Wies to hard labor. We ask for your instructions. Molotov approved the verdict, and on January 5th, 1946, that public execution took place. Officially, no one spoke about it, but Leningrad citizens knew perfectly well when everything would happen. So one morning on January 5th, 
several tens of thousands of people gathered on Kalininska Square. According to eyewitnesses, the condemned behaved calmly, and the execution itself passed quickly and casually. The convicts were put on the back, the soldiers quickly put bags on their heads, tightened the loops, and then the truck started moving. A sentry was placed next to the gallows, however, according to eyewitnesses, a day later, an unknown person removed the boots from the hanged ones. Some in the crowd at the time of the execution got sick. Someone fainted, but no indignation was expressed at the execution. As the Leningrad press wrote the next day, they escaped the fair bullet of a Soviet soldier at the front. Now they had to test the strength of the rope. They again heard the whistle and curses that accompanied them to a shameful death. Cars started moving. The last point of support has gone from under the feet of the convicts.